from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out on a, a wet, but at least not snowy day here in Washington, D.C. Uh, my name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the library. And I want to welcome you to the first Literary Birthdays event of the spring, celebrating writer Philip Roth. First, uh, before we begin, let me ask you to turn off your cell phones or any electronic uh, devices that you have that might interfere with uh, this afternoon's event. Uh, second, uh, please note that this program is being recorded and by participating you give us permission for future use of the recording. I'll also tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center here at the library. We are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and we put on literary readings, lectures, panels, and so on uh, all throughout the year. If you would like to uh, find out more about events like this, we have a sign-up sheet uh, in the foyer. We also have a selected list of our upcoming programs, including our next literary birthday celebrations. Um, I think the next one is uh, Vladimir Nabokov in April. Uh, we are thrilled today to celebrate Philip Roth's 81st birthday. You can read more about him and about our featured readers, Sam Lipsight and Howard Norman, uh, in our print program, which you should have gotten on your chair. Uh, the event is especially meaningful to us as Roth was unable to attend the National Book Festival back in 2012, where he was slated to receive the festival's Creative Achievement Award. Today, we have a new opportunity to honor Roth and his work with two of America's great fiction writers. I'll explain a little bit about the program itself. Our two featured readers will read in alphabetical order, and they'll read their favorite Roth selections and connect uh, those selections and, and him as a writer to their own work. Uh, following the readings, Alice Burney of our Manuscripts Division will say a few words about our great uh, and full tabletop display of materials from our Philip Roth papers. Uh, and she will talk also about the great work that the Manuscripts Division does to ensure that future generations can connect to the exemplars of our culture. If you would like to know more about the Manuscripts Division, you can visit their website, www.loc.gov slash rr slash mss. And you can visit our website at loc.gov slash poetry. And now, please join me in welcoming Sam Lipsight and Howard Norman. Uh, hello. And uh, I'd like to wish Philip Roth a very happy birthday. I think I'll speak for a moment about my adventures with Roth as, as a reader and then read uh, a bit from one of my favorite Roth books. When I was 13 or 14 living in northern New Jersey in a split level on Knickerbocker Road, I was banished to the basement. Well, not banished, because I'd requested it. No, I hadn't requested it. I'd begged to be allowed to sleep away from the others on the second floor, to set up camp in the depths of the house, where the tiny windows were eye level with the topsoil in my mother's tulip bed. I lived a very private adolescent life in this lair. I did my homework, dreamed about the future. Sometimes I sang along to my favorite records into an upside down hockey stick trying to be Bruce Springsteen in the mirror. And inevitably, I guess, I discovered myself as an erotic object. <laughs> Varieties, techniques, positions, radical mental image collage. When years later, a book critic accused me of being a mere stylist, I thought, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> One of the main features of this basement room, however, were the long bookshelves fastened to the walls. And these were full of, full of old books. Most of them my parents had bought in the past and read and consigned down to the, this basement lair. 
And here in my junior burrow, the shelves were full of 20th century big American lit from Henry James to Hemingway and Faulkner and Fitzgerald, Cheever, Updike, Bellow, Mailer, Malamud, and others from the old American men's club, to which I understood at that time white Jewish men had been fairly recently admitted. Anyway, even at the mighty age of 14 or 15, you can only go at yourself a finite number of times. At a certain point, I decided to have a go at the shelves. I wish I could say that the instant I took certain of these novels down, the ambassadors say, or light in August, the world opened up to me. But it took a long, long time. This was a perfect place for a precocious kid surrounded by these authors. But I don't think I was precocious enough. Bless my parents for dropping me in the pool, sink or swim style. But mostly I sank. Eventually I doggy paddled. Then I read Portnoy's complaint. It astonished me. It was as foreign to me as Updike or Cheever in some respects, for though I was a Jewish kid from New Jersey, Roth was from another Jewishness, another New Jersey. My parents were Roth's generation. They were secular, assimilated. I had no Jewish tradition in my house. I never had a bar mitzvah. I didn't live among many Jews. In grade school, the Irish and Italian kids threw pennies at my feet. It took me a while to get the so-called joke Whereupon, as the Jew with the most body mass, I was often elected to fight for my tribe. <laughs> but I had no sense of tribe. I had a Jewish mother, but she was an extremely intelligent woman trying to negotiate with herself the concept of the Jewish mother. In many ways, the struggles of Alexander Portnoy would never quite be mine, except for struggles with dinner meat, perhaps. It was never the what, the brazen portrayal of a previous Jewish generation that bowled me over. It was the how, it was Portnoy's or Roth's voice, the rhythms, the energy, the cadences, the acoustics, the serious play of his sentences that got me, got me in the kishkas, you might say. It coursed through my body. I knew and I didn't know it. And over the years, I read more and more Roth, the Zuckerman books and so on. I loved the ghost writer, the Prague orgy, the counter life. I soaked it all up. And even as I knew Roth disdained the title Jewish American writer, Roth's books weirdly made the old Jewish ways, the ones his protagonists often felt shackled by, attractive to me. But I also knew something, that as a Jew from New Jersey with literary ambitions, I had to make a break for it, find other models, masters, mentors. It used to be fashionable to talk about what the critic Harold Bloom called the anxiety of influence. It's not fashionable anymore, and for a lot of well-intentioned reasons, but it doesn't mean it isn't true. You do try to shrug it all off, but it needn't be this anguished battle. It's just that you realize you can't be anybody else. But when a young writer tries to be many different writers, that's not a bad thing. By failing to be your conception of other people, you can often find a way to accommodate your many selves in fiction and in life. When I returned to Roth, it was to read Sabbath's Theater, which was published in 1995 and won the National Book Award. This is my favorite Roth book. This is where it all comes together for me, the big number, Eros and Thanatos and some kind of hilarious and wounding Busby Berkeley spectacular. It's the story of a ruined man, Mickey Sabbath, a former avant-garde puppeteer who passed up the chance to be Big Bird so he could be true to his art. His art, though, hasn't existed for a long time. It's what the world would call his depravity that he lives for now. He lives by his own code, an antiquated code, where to eschew monogamy, bourgeois stability, conventional morality, to have, as another hero of mine, Barry Hanna once wrote, exactly enough courage to jaywalk or cheat a wife or a friend with a quote from Nietzsche on your lips, is to stand up to society's brute oppression. This code leads him down dark, indecent paths, makes us doubt his sanity, but really he is beyond it now. This is a man who has cataloged his phone sex tapes so he can leave them to the Library of Congress. <laughs> He's a Quixote of quickies who now grieves suicidally over the death of his last mit mistress, Drenka, as he continues to grieve for his first wife, who disappeared under strange circumstances, and his beloved brother, who died in World War II, and his mother, who still talks to him from beyond the grave. He's a dirty old man not above stealing the underwear of his old friend's daughter while trying to seduce his wife. 
but he's also one of the great characters in 20th century fiction. Lear, Falstaff, Whitman, all rolled into one wild, randy, huge heart storm. And it is his profane desires and deeds, his immaturity, his mature immaturity, as the scholar Ross Posnick has put it, his refusal to act as age, to be civil, to pinch off the flow of his id that finally destroys him, or maybe doesn't. But either way, while his deeds may outrage, his utterance, raw, poetic, mad, unstable, unflinching, endures. He's Mickey Sabbath. And here, he's just woken up in the bedroom of his friend Norman's daughter, Debbie, who's at college. Later, he's to attend the funeral of an old friend, Link, a suicide. Whores played a leading role in my life. Always felt at home with whores, particularly fond of whores, the stew-like stink of those oniony parts. What has ever meant more to me? Real reasons for existence then, but now, preposterously, the morning hard-on was gone. The things one has to put up with in life. The morning hard-on, like a crowbar in your hand, like something growing out of an ogre. Does any other species wake up with a hard-on? Do whales? Do bats? Evolution's daily reminder to male homo sapiens in case overnight they forget why they're here. If a woman didn't know what it was, it might as well scare her to death. Couldn't piss in the bowl because of that thing. Had to force it downward with your hand. Had to train it as you would a dog to the leash so that the stream struck the water and not the upturned seat. When you sat to shit, there it was, loyally looking up at its master. There, eagerly waiting while you brush your teeth. What are we going to do today? Nothing more faithful in all of life than the lurid cravings of the morning hard-on. No deceit in it, no simulation, no insincerity. All hail to the driving force, human living with a capital L. It takes a lifetime to determine what matters, and by then it's not there anymore. Well, one must learn to adapt. How is the only problem? He tried to think of a reason to get up, let alone to go on living. Deborah's toilet seat, a glimpse of Link's corpse, her things, and remembering delving into the things, he was out of the bed and across to the dresser beside the Bang & Olufsen music system. Brimming, a treasure trove, brilliant hues of silk and satin, childish cotton underpants with red circus stripes, string bikinis with satin behinds, stretched satin thong bikinis, floss your teeth with those thongs, garter belts in purple, black, and white, Renoir's palette, Rose, pale pink, navy, white, purple, gold, red, peach, underwired black embroidered bras, lace push-up bras with little bows, scalloped lace half bras, satin half bras, C-cup, a viper's nest of multicolored pantyhose, in white, black, and a chocolatey brown, sheer silk lace panty pantyhose of the kind that drank a war to drive him nuts, a delicious butterscotch color silk camisole, Leopard print panties with matching bra, lace body stockings, three and all black, a strapless black satin bodysuit with padded push-up cups edged with lace and hooks and straps, straps, bra straps, garter straps, Victorian corset straps. Who in his right mind doesn't adore straps? All the abracadabra of holding and lifting. And what about strapless, a strapless bra? Christ, everything works. The thing they call a teddy, Roosevelt, Kennedy, Herzl. <laughs> All in one chemise up top and down below, loose fitting panties with leg holes that you slip right into without removing a thing. Silk floral bikini underpants, half slips. Loved the outmoded half slip. A woman in a half slip and a bra standing and ironing a shirt while seriously smoking a cigarette. Sentimental old Sabbath. I'm skipping ahead now. Drawing open the curtains, he discovered that Deborah's was a corner room whose windows looked out across Central Park to the apartment buildings on the east side. The daffodils and the leafing of the trees still had three weeks to work their way to, Mad to Madamaska Falls. That's where he lives. But Central Park could have been Savannah. The panorama Debbie had teethed on, but he'd still take the shore any day. What had he been doing in a forest on a mountaintop? 
When he'd fled Nikki's disappearance, he and Rosanna should have gone to Jersey to live by the sea, should have become a commercial fisherman, should have dumped Rosanna and gone back to sea. Puppets of all the fucking callings. Between puppets and whores, he chooses puppets. For that alone, he deserves to die. <laughs> Only now did he see the assorted pieces of Deborah's underwear strewn about at the foot of the bureau, as though she had just hurriedly undressed or been undressed and run from the room, pleasant to imagine. He had only guessed that he'd already been into the underwear during the night. He had no recollection. He must have got up in his sleep to look at her things and spilled some onto the floor. Deep into self-caricature now. I am more of a menace than I realize. This is serious. Premature senility. Dementia. Hell-bent for disaster or rotomania. And what of it? A natural human occurrence. The words, the world's rejuvena rejuvenation. Drenka is dead, but Deborah lives, and round the clock at the sex factory, the furnaces are burning away. As he dressed in what he wore wherever he went, day in and day out, frayed flannel shirt over an old khaki t-shirt, baggy bottom-heavy corduroys, he listened to hear if anyone was home. Only 8.15, but already emptied out. He could not at first choose from what lay on the floor between a black underwire bra and a pair of silk floral bikini underpants, but thinking that the bra, because of the wiring, might prove bulky and draw attention, he took the panties, shoved them into his trouser pocket, and dropped the rest into the piled-up drawer. He could play there again tonight, and in other drawers, and in the closet. The Law of Living fluctuation, for every thought a counter-thought, for every urge a counter-urge. No wonder either you go crazy and die or decide to disappear. Too many urges, and that's not even a tenth of the story. Mistressless, wifeless, vocationless, homeless, penniless, he steals the bikini panties of a 19-year-old nothing and, riding a swell of adrenaline, stuffs them for safekeeping in his pocket. These panties are just what he needs. Does no one else's brain work in quite this way? I don't believe that. This is aging, pure and simple, the self-destroying hilarity of the last roller coaster. Sabbath meets his match, life. The puppet is you. The grotesque buffoon is you. Your punch, schmuck, the puppet who toys with taboos. In the large kitchen with the terracotta floor, a kitchen ablaze with sunshine on polished copperware, robust as a greenhouse with gleaming potted plants, Sabbath found a place set for him at the table, facing the view. Surrounding his dishes and cutlery were boxes of four brands of cereal, three differently shaped, differently shaded loaves of hearty looking bread, a tub of margarine, a dish of butter, and eight jars of preserves, more or less the band of colors you get by passing sunlight through a prism, black cherry, strawberry, little scarlet, all the way to green gauge plum and lemon marmalade, a spectral yellow. There was half a honeydew as well as half a grapefruit segmented under a taut sheet of, sheet of saran wrap, a small basket of nipp nippled, nippled oranges of a suggestive variety he'd come across before, and an assortment of tea bags in a dish beside his place setting. The breakfast crockery was that heavy yellow French stuff decorated with childlike renderings of peasants and windmills. Compare, beyond compare. Now, why do I alone in America think this is shit? Why didn't I want to live like this? To be sure, producers characteristically provided for themselves more like poshas than transgressive puppeteers do, but this is awfully nice to wake up to. Pocket full of panties and jar upon jar of tip tree, tip tree preserves. Affixed to its lid, the little scarlet sported a price tag reading $8.95. And now he will talk to his mother, who died a long time ago. Right, Ma? You had incoherence in spades. The death of Morty still defies belief. You were right to shut up after that. You think like a failure, Sabbath's mother replied. I am a failure. I was saying that to Norm only last night. I am at the very pinnacle of failure. How else should I think? All you ever wanted were whorehouses and whores. You have the ideology of a pimp. You should have been one. Ideology, no less. How knowing she had become in the afterlife. They must give courses. 
It's too late, Ma. The black guys have got the market cornered. Try again. You should have led a normal and productive life. You should have had a family. You should have had a profession. You shouldn't have run away from life. Puppets. It seemed like a good idea at the time, Mother. I even studied in Italy. You studied whores in Italy. You deliberately set out to live on the wrong side of existence. You should have had my worries. But I do, I do, crying again. I do. I have your worries exactly. Then why do you go around with an Alta Cocker's beard and wearing your playground clothes and with whores? Quarrel if you like with the clothes and the whores, but the beard is essential if I don't want to look at my face. You look like a beast. And what should I look like, Norman? Norman was always a lovely boy. And I? You always got your excitement in other ways, always. Even as a tiny child, you were a little stranger in the house. Is that true? I didn't know that. I was so happy. But always a little stranger, making everything into a farce. Everything? You? Of course. Look now, making death itself into a farce. Is there anything more serious than dying? No, but you want to make it into a farce. Even killing yourself you won't do with dignity. That's asking a lot. I don't think anyone who kills himself kills himself with dignity. I don't believe that's possible. Then you be the first. Make us proud. <laughs> but how, mother? Thanks. That's funny, Sam. <laughs> Such a great book. Um, so, Robert, thank you for inviting Sam and I. And it's especially nice to see Amy Stolls here, who's the director of the literature program at the NEA, and also a wonderful novelist, really a terrific writer. Um, the auspices under which I think we were invited partly was to talk about influence uh, of our work, uh, of Sam's and my work, from Philip Roth. Uh, so I'm just going to read a little something and then read from the ghostwriter, which uh, so much time has passed now um, since that was written. My writing is not, except perhaps in the most general use of the word, influenced by the works of Philip Roth. To suggest that it is would be sheer hubris. It would elevate my own writing, even if briefly to the highest echelon of regard. I can only speak for myself here, and I mean this with absolute conviction. Influence, of course, may mean different things to different people. For instance, Philip Roth's preoccupation with the complicated realm of ambiguous ancestry, of young America confronting old Europe, even of writing as a way to heal personal and historical wounds, were subjects that haunted Henry James. Is that James' influence on Roth? I don't know. Maybe they are simply antecedent claims on the world itself. But put in simple terms, I feel that Roth's genius cannot really bestow or even accommodate influence. He's just too original. And I feel the same way about Thomas Pynchon, Genus, Gina Barriot, Elsa Morante, Chekhov. My selection is from The Ghost Rider, which was, well, I just want to stop for a second because Sam read so wonderfully. Um, I met Philip Roth only once, very briefly, and he said, well, all those books that you write about the Canadian Maritimes, you know, Nova Scotia and those strange places up in Canada, what's your mother think about that? <laughs> of course, to be asked a question about a Jewish mother by Philip Roth is already an anointment of sorts. Um, <laughs> But I said, well, uh, every time I send my mother uh, a book, she calls me and she said, I read your book, Still No Jews. <laughs> Which, it's probably pretty hard to make Philip Roth laugh, but he did <laughs> chuckle a little bit. Um, my selection um, today is from The Ghostwriter which was published in 1979 after 
appearing in its entirety in the New, in the New Yorker. There was an American Playhouse television adaptation, if you are interested, that starred, perhaps ironically, Claire Bloom as the long-suffering writer's wife. It's really an excellent uh, production. In previous books, Philip Roth had featured his doppelganger, or as Chekhov called it, a shadowing figure in the person of Nathan Zuckerman. In The Ghost Rider, however, we are presented Nathan in the 1950s. Nathan is a 23-year-old self-proclaimed writer who arrives to New England, a uh, kind of picture postcard winter farmhouse setting. It's a kind of pilgrimage to the uh, reclusive writer Manny Lonoff, his literary idol. Born in Europe and raised in Palestine, Manny has been married to Hope for 35 years. Lonoff has, quote, written short stories about wandering Jews unlike anything written before by any Jew who had wandered into America. Wanting to submit himself for candidacy as nothing less than Lonoff's spiritual son, to petition for his moral sponsorship and to win the magical protection of his advocacy and his love, Nathan experiences something that seems part seance and part vivid reality or an uncanny duet of both. He experiences an entirely unforeseen and impossible to predict evening of just one night at Lonoff's house. For one thing, he very quickly understands something of the emotional claustrophobia that has put Mrs. Hope Lonoff into a state of extremis. Her astonishing despair is throughout the novel, and especially in the screen adaptation, reduced to this phrase, chuck me out. And when Claire Bloom says it, you just feel like she's talking directly to you, like it's a kind of indictment of all husbands, and it's really powerful when she does it. But perhaps the most central uh, to our plot is there's a young woman uh, staying in the house named Amy Balat, uh, and Nathan begins to start to imagine her to be Manny's daughter, and he immediately falls in love with her. But she's actually one of Lonoff's former students, and perhaps his mistress. We don't quite know yet. And Nathan begins then to fantasize on a whole other level of narrative imagination that she is Anne Frank. And that's what I mean by this setting being the setting of a kind of historical seance, is that uh, Nathan's imagination starts to uh, become uh, a form of probity, but also of his own ambition. Because um, as his fantasy throughout the night intensifies, Nathan begins to realize that he has to marry Amy in order to redeem himself from his family's indictment, essentially, of being a self-hating Jew. And who better to re redeem himself with to a Jewish family than Anne Frank. Uh, enough plot description here. Um, I think the thing is about the Ghost Rider, it seamlessly shifts from analytical to the ambiguous, and it subverts all convenient notions of artistic truthfulness and ambition. And I must say, it is one of the most disturbing and perversely beguiling portraits of the imploded sufferings of a marriage that I have ever read, perhaps since Robert Frost's poem, Home Burial, which you might remember, you know, that narrative poem. I, I saw her at the top of the stairs before she saw me, and it's about a loss, but it's, the loss only intensifies things that already exist. Um, it's one of Roth's favorite poems. But as Salmon, my ma partial mandate today was to address the idea of influence, 
I want to say why, in part, I've chosen passages from the chapter titled Nathan Daedalus. The ghostwriter, amongst its many remarkable accomplishments, puts Roth's literary erudition on a high exhibit. All sorts of writers are mentioned in this book. This is a story, after all, about literary inheritance. Hemingway, Babel, Henry James, Flaubert, and others. And of course, not to uh, um, forget the literary di diarist Anne Frank herself. Um, part of the mourning of this person, as you saw, the um, a young writer at work in the diary. Uh, in my own next forthcoming novel, Next Life Might Be Kinder, published this May, three times I describe, mainly an inventory of objects, the writing space of my main character, Elizabeth Church, who is trying to finish a doctoral thesis about the British novelist, Marganita Lasky. The reason I mention this at all is because I modeled, I'm using that word advisedly, my attempt to create a familiar yet hopefully idiosyncratic atmosphere where writing actually takes place. I'm referring to the projected romance of the writing life, which is a difficult life, but if writing is the one way one organizes one's emotions, you have to have a place to do the writing, and therefore the whole antecedent history of the romance of the writer's office um, is inherited and, and I think wonderfully animated in Roth's uh, The Ghost Writer. Um, so now I'll read from that chapter and then I'm going to end with a, a, a little uh, chapter in which Amy Ballette calls uh, and um, describes herself as, as Anne Frank. Nathan Daedalus. <clears throat> Who could sleep after that? I didn't even turn the lamp off to try. This is after a long conversation. For the longest time, I just stared at E.I. Lonoff's tidy desk. Neat piles of typing paper, each stack a different pale color for different drafts, I assumed. Finally, I got up, and sacrilege, though it surely was, sat on his typing chair in my undershorts. No wonder his back hurt. It wasn't a chair made for relaxing in, not if you were his size. Lightly, I touched my fingers to his portable typewriter keys. Why a portable for a man who went nowhere? Why not a machine on the order of a cannonball, black and big and built to write for all time? Why not a comfortable padded executive's chair to lean back in and think? Why not indeed? Pinned to the bulletin board beside his desk, the cell's only real embellishments were a little wall calendar from the local bank and two annotated index cards. One card bore a fragmentary sentence ascribed to Schumann on, Cho on, on Chopin's Scherzo No. 2 in B-flat minor. It read, so overflowing with tenderness, boldness, love, and contempt, that it may be compared, not inappropriately, to a poem by Byron. I didn't know what to make of it there, or rather what Lonoff made of it, until I remembered that Amy Ballette could play Chopin with great charm. Maybe it was she who had typed it out for him, scrupulous attribution in all, and closing it, perhaps, with the gift of a record so that late in the afternoons he could listen to Chopin even when she was no longer around. Perhaps it was this very line she'd been musing upon when I first saw her on the study floor. Musing because the description seemed as pertinent to herself as to the music. If displaced, what had become of her family? Murdered? Did that explain her contempt? But for whom the overflowing love then? Him? If so, the contempt might well be for Hope, the wife. If so, if so. It required no ingenuity to guess the appeal of the quotation typed on the other card. After what Lonoff had been telling me all evening, I could understand why he might want these three sentences hanging over his head, while beneath them he sat turning his own sentences around. We work in the dark, this is the quote. We work in the dark, 
and do what we can. We give what we have. Our doubt is our passion, and our passion is our task. The rest is the madness of art. Sentiments ascribed to a story I did not know by Henry James called The Middle Years. But the madness of art? I would have thought the madness of everything but art. The art was what was, what was sane, no? Or was I missing something? Before the night was over, I was to read The Middle Years twice through, as though preparing to be examined on it in the morning. But that was canon law to me then, ready to write a thousand words on what does Henry James mean by the madness of art, if the question should happen to turn up on my paper napkin at breakfast. That section, um, as, as Samuel knows, goes on to describe um, the study, Lonoff's study, as the place from which all these energies, both um, positive and very severely melancholy, emanate. And, 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 and in a way, people keep coming back around as if it's got a magnetic pull. He describes this office a number of times. But I want to end with, um, I think, my favorite chapter. If, if I, I, you know, to, to, to say there's a favorite chapter in a Philip Roth book is really reductionist thinking. Because, I mean, it, this is a seamless no novel. It just moves so beautifully. But the title is Femme Fatale. So in this case, he uses um, uh, the figure of Anne Frank and Amy Bellet uh, intertwined as a kind of duet between the past and the present. Um, it was only a year earlier that Amy had told Lanoff her whole story. Weeping hysterically, she had phoned him one night from the Biltmore Hotel in New York. As best he could understand, that morning she had come down alone on a train from Boston to see the matinee performance of a play intending to return home again by train in the evening. Instead, after coming out of the theater, she had taken a hotel room where ever since she had been, quote, in hiding. At midnight, having only just finished his evening's reading and gone up to bed, Lonoff got into his car and drove south. By four, he had reached the city. By six, she had told him that it was the dramatization of Anne Frank's diary she had come to New York to see. But it was mid-morning before she could explain, even somewhat coherently, her connection with this new Broadway play. It wasn't the play, she said. I could have watched that easily enough if I had been alone. It was the people watching with me. Carloads of women kept pulling up to the theater, women wearing fur coats with expensive shoes and handbags. I thought, this isn't for me. The billboards, the photographs, the marquee. I could take all of that, but it was the women who frightened me and their families and their children and their homes. Go to a movie, I told myself. Go instead to a museum. But I showed my ticket. I went in with them, and of course it happened. It had to have happened. It's what happens there. The women cried. Everyone around me was in tears. Then at the end, in the row behind me, a woman screamed, Oh no! That's why I came running here. I wanted a room with a telephone in it where I could stay until I'd found my father. But all I did once I was here was sit in the bathroom thinking that if he knew, if I told him, then they would have to come out on the stage after each performance and announce, but she is really alive. You needn't worry. She survived. She is 26 now and doing very well. I would say to him, you must keep this our secret. No one but you must ever know, but suppose he was found out. What if we both were? Manny, I couldn't call him, and I knew I couldn't when I heard that woman scream, Oh no! I knew then what's been true all along. I'll never see him again. I have to be dead to everyone. Thank you. A year ago, on this date, I was in Newark, New Jersey, as one of the invited guests at Philip Roth's grand 80th birthday celebration. The day before, I had given a paper there as part of a biography panel for the Philip Roth Society, 
It was, of course, about the Roth papers at the Library of Congress. I was invited to these events because of my position as literary specialist in the manuscript division, because I engineered the acquisition of most of the Roth papers, and because I have consequently known Roth for the last 20 years. The birthday celebration was a grand affair. Hundreds also purchased tickets to it to benefit the Newark Historic Preservation Society. The events included a narrated three-hour bus tour of Roth's Newark, and uh, it showed such things as his high school and his home, which has a plaque on it now. And, um, and a display of 100 of his life photographs, a few of which I've scattered in, in there as we acquired scans and um, afterwards, and, and these are photocopies of the scans. And an evening of brilliant lectures about Roth at the Newark Museum. Speakers included Jonathan Lethem, Hermione Lee Allen, and Alan Finkelkraut, Claudia Roth Pierpont, and Edna O'Brien. There followed a dazzling tour de force speech and reading by Roth himself, and he chose to read from the Sabbath, Sabbath's Theater, his favorite book. Very moving. At the reception, author Louise Erdrich gave a toast in Ojibwe, accompanied by drummers. I have brought you some souvenirs today, as well as samples from our Roth papers, um, but let me backtrack a bit. The Library of Congress now holds approximately 70 million items in its manuscript collections. These feature the papers of 23 early presidents and pioneers in many fields, the Wright brothers, Alexander Graham Bell, Sigmund Freud, Ambassador Avril Harriman, abolitionist Frederick Douglass, Margaret Mead, Margaret Sanger, and Justice Earl Warren and Thurgood Marshall, for example. There are also over 2,000 literary and theatrical collections, which I'm in charge of. We have, for example, the major Walt Whitman collections and the papers of Edna St. Vincent Millay, Bernard Malamud, Lee Strasberg, Ralph Ellison, and Philip Roth. I have 41 years at the Library of Congress, but I assumed the post of literary manuscript specialist only in 1990. At that time, I found much of the Roth collection had been in a state of limbo for the past two decades. The library had invited him to donate his papers shortly after he won the 1960 National Book Award for Goodbye Columbus and Five Short Stories. He donated his early papers, drafts for the first four books and material from his college days in 1969, and those early materials became our permanent possessions. But when the tax law changed in 1970, prohibiting authors from taking fair market value deductions for such charitable gifts, almost all gifts of literary manuscripts froze. During the subsequent years, authors were encouraged to add more manuscripts, which would, however, only be on deposit, as libraries and authors alike hoped every year for a reform of the IRS ban. But it did not change, and consequently, many collect literary collections were truncated or split, uh, causing difficulties for researchers. During the next two decades, Roth deposited a mass of additional material which we could not archive because it was only on deposit. In 1993, I devised a plan to acquire that deposit material and subsequent papers by contract with the author. Since he kept his papers in roughly chronological order, later editions would be made in five-year increments, the five-year plan. The, these acquisitions have been made for his papers through 2004. Our archivist um, arranged some 25,000 items eventually uh, in 299 containers. In these we have correspondence, drafts, galleys, notes, interviews, play scripts, clippings, photographs, the papers for 2000 to 2004 remain unprocessed in seven cartons. Um, these include 
the materials for all those, those, the novels produced during that time, The Human Stain Through the Plot Against America, and correspondence uh, at that time. Access to the deposited materials was originally restricted to researchers who had Roth's permission, but that has changed under the agreement in 93 uh, with him. Um, and uh, it was my pleasure and a nice surprise after 15 years silence when I first started this work to get a call from Roth and for him to say with evident amusement that he had noticed mice getting into his papers and that they had eaten some choice cuts. He needed a safe solution. Eventually, staff members were relieved to see that Connecticut mice apparently lacked literary taste and had spared us 46 cartons of primary documents, 16,000 unnibbled items. After the collection was arranged and box, the restrictions were reduced, as I have said. Let's skip. Um, I could read you some of the incredible, um, impressive correspondence in the collection, but I will let you look through this list of correspondence um, on your own, if you're interested. And um, these are people, writers, literary, uh, literary issues, political and social issues, family, political friends, mutual friends. Um, many letters document the various reactions to Roth's writings about the evolving American Jewish culture. Other Jewish letter writers include Saul Bellow, Irving Howe, Alfred Kazin, and Bernard Malamud. Um, okay. And we have all the revisions he saved. He visited me at the Library of Congress four times during this period, first with Claire Bloom, later with various friends. He first came to view his unprocessed collection and the newly assembled correspondence, um, which he quipped seemed radioactive to him, so we had to move to another room, because these are the emanations of all his friends and acquaintances. He came to dance at a library gala in 1997, and stopped by with friends for a manuscript division tour before going to the White House to accept the 2010 National Humanities Medal from President Obama. Last September, the library awarded him, as you've, as you've heard, a Lifetime Achievement Award in fiction. And during these years, he's often called me for help in uh, research in some of his works. Um, Today I have on the table for your perusal, just a little drop in the bucket, uh, a few images from the 2013 Newark tour, which are the photocopies, some color printouts, which I selected and sent to Le Monde for, for their Roth, I didn't bring those, for their Roth um, special issue. <laughs> and um, selected item, letters from Saul Bellow, Claire Bloom, Allen Ginsberg, um, and a draft of Goodbye Columbus was near the final draft, still full of corrections. A Nice Jewish Boy, an uncompleted novel. A sample of patrimony manuscript, the Schicks's section of Portnoy's complaint. some readers' responses to Portnoy, <laughs> a sample of the photographs, uh, the jacket, I brought the jacket photo for American Pastoral, which is so moving and has uh, Philip in the background. Before I conclude, I would like to read to you the speech that he never gave uh, in 2012. No one has ever seen or heard it, and it's not unpublished, undelivered, a speech that he was going, that he wrote to accept the Library of Congress Creative Achievement Award. Um, he couldn't uh, come in person because of a back ailment. And this is what he wrote. Acceptance speech, Library of Congress Creative Achievement Award, September 22nd, 2012. I wrote the first stories of mine ever to be published right here in Washington, D.C. 
I was 23. I had been drafted out of graduate school following the Korean War and in 1956 was an Army private stationed in the Public Information Office at Walter Reed Army Hospital. During the day, after interviewing new patients admitted to this hospital, I wrote news releases about each of them to be filed with their hometown newspapers. Most evenings after dinner at the mess hall with my friends, I returned alone to my hospital office located on a silent administrative corridor and sitting at my office typewriter, I began to compose some of the stories that would appear three years later in Goodbye Columbus. On the nights I didn't write, I had a GI's complimentary ticket to a Library of Congress chamber music series and traveled down from Walter Reed to hear the Budapest String Quartet. Those astonishing musicians were in residence here that year. And so it was that during those same months in Washington, when I had my first sustained exuberant stint as an earnest young apprentice writing fiction, I simultaneously enjoyed, as a musical innocent, my first delectable evenings of listening to Mozart and the marvel of the clarinet quintet. And now this award. Back in Washington at the Library of Congress, there is this award which I accept with pride and delight, remembering how so much of what captivated me as a young man first took hold right here. Philip Roth. Thanks, Alice, for that presentation and for that reading. And uh, thanks to both of our readers, Sam Lipsight and Howard Norman. Uh, please do come up and check out the materials. Alice will be up here to explain them. Uh, and also, uh, we have some books for sale in the back in the foyer uh, by both of our presenters. We'd love for you to buy them and get them signed, and they would too. And uh, as I told you earlier, you can check out our upcoming events, uh, including our next uh, literary birthday celebration, and sign up for uh, our sign up, sign up our sign up sheet so we can uh, let you know ourselves. Thanks so much for coming, and have a great day. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.